getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 172, Rommel Readies for Success. Last time, late on November 22, 1941, Rommel and his subordinate, General Kuvel, had made their dispositions to, hopefully, finish off the British forces to the south of the city Rizeg airstrip. Much British armor had been destroyed that day. Now, it was just a matter of crushing what was left. In between the hammer of Rommel's armor pushing up from the south and the anvil of his waiting infantry and their massed artillery along the ridge just north of the airstrip. In between these forces were the remaining trapped units of the 22nd Armored Brigade, the 5th South African Brigade, and the 7th Armored Division, and they didn't know they were trapped. Besides which, Cunningham, back at HQ, thought his side was winning, so expected the next day to see the last of the Germans and the escape of General Scobie and his men hold up at Tobruk. Sunday, November 23rd, was the Lutheran All Saints Day, or Sunday of the Dead, Tolton Sontag, and the events of that day would live up to this designation. As dawn came, General William Gott's 7th Armored Division formed itself up, facing to the north. As they were to the right or east of the British line, the plan was, once they were joined by the New Zealanders coming from further east, they would all move out to clear the way for their comrades at Tobruk to make their escape. Meanwhile, covering their backs to the south, once Gott's tanks advanced to the ridge to the north, would be the 5th South African Brigade, already in position, just to Gott's left or west. Moreover, the 1st South African Brigade, coming up from further south, would join the 5th South African, thus strengthening the shield protecting Gott's back. But what none of them knew was that the 1st South African would not make it that far. The 5th South African had formed itself up into an incomplete box with men and guns to its northern, eastern, and western sides, thinking that any possible threat would come from the north. However, Brigadier Armstrong, commander of the 5th South African Brigade, did little to protect his own position to the south. There, scattered about, were a few logistics vehicles and their crews, not front-line fighters, and they were too far and few in between anyways to be an effective defense, what being responsible for a two-mile line. So, as far as the main British forces near the airfield, their composition was thus. Facing north, the right flank consisted of the remains of the 7th Armored Division, and they were waiting for the New Zealander infantry to come from the east. To the 7th's left, or west, was the 5th South African Brigade. To the 5th South African's west, or left, were the remains of the 22nd Armored Brigade. All three groups waited, knowing that the 1st South African Brigade was on their way up from the south. But what they didn't know, specifically, though they probably guessed in general terms, was that, to their north, along the ridge, were units of the Africa Corps Infantry and the infantry of the 21st Panzer Division. The only bright spot for the Commonwealth forces was that of the 100 tanks of the 4th Armored Brigade. It was to the east of the main British line, by some 20 miles. These tanks were the ones that had been held up waiting to refuel the day before. General Cruvel got the day's action started off, but in a bad way. Having left his headquarters at Gambit, located about 15 miles east by northeast of the city Rizeg airfield, 
Cruvel made his way to join up with Major General Walter Newman Sokow and his now rusted men. Once together, they would start the trek south to get in behind the British armor. But unfortunately, or fortunately for Cruvel, just after he left, the 4th New Zealand Brigade came along the Via Balbia, just off the coast, and captured Gambit. Now the attacking general only had the basics of communications, which did not hurt him this day, as his plans had already been laid out but it would affect future operations. Then Cruvel found himself waiting, and waiting some more, just to the east of the ridge that the British were under, as he was to meet up with Ravenstein's 5th Panzer Regiment and the 15th Panzer Division. The 15th Panzer Division was there, but not the 5th Regiment. But not wanting to lose the morning, Cruvel started south without the 5th Panzer. They would just have to catch up. Now that the Panzers were on their way, their course turned to a southwesterly direction, which caused them to miss the eastern section of the 5th South African Brigade's wall, but put them directly into the almost non-existent southern wall. The Germans scattered most of the British units before them, but some fought back before leaving the area. Newman Silkow, seeing how easy it was to push the British away, requested permission to turn to the northwest right now and head for the center of the British line as it was facing to the north. But Cruvel had been impressed with the calmness of which those few British units which stood their ground. No, he decided, we will stick to the plan. They would meet up with the Ariete Division under General Gambera and only then move north. To attack. The Germans and Italians met around noon to the south of the British position, and they were soon joined by the tardy 5th Panzer Regiment. But before they could move out against the British to the north, parts of General Brink's 1st South African Division ran into them, coming north. Both sides were equally caught off guard. Nonetheless, the South Africans quickly got their artillery into a line and commenced firing. This part of the division did not have tanks with them. General Cruvel could see that this was not a major attack, and besides, he was losing daylight. So, leaving some men behind to keep the South Africans away, he took the majority of his forces and moved out to the north. Though the first South Africans didn't have the numbers or firepower to seriously damage the enemy, it was still imprudent for Cruvel to do this. However, in his defense, his taskmaster of a superior, Rommel, was expecting results. On more than one occasion, the Desert Fox had issued an order to someone that was not carried out for whatever reason. So he traveled to the unit in question, took over, and got the job done, only then sacking the seemingly lackluster commander. That wasn't going to happen to Cruvel. But as the Germans moved out, they soon found that they had the full attention of the 5th South African Brigade and the 22nd Armour Brigade to their north. They had been put on full alert, thanks to the earlier clash with the weak southern South African line. And more besides, the Germans were being skirmished to their east by a part of the 4th Armoured Brigade that had been sent ahead of the larger force. So, as Cruvel had the Germans and the Italian tanks fuel up, ready to engage the enemy to the north, they were being shelled from the south, north, and east. Several Axis tanks were lost as the refueling went on. By 3 p.m. that afternoon, the Panzers and the Italians were resupplied and refueled. Cruvel gave the order that the tanks, trucks, and towed artillery pieces were not only to stay in their formation— but no one was to stop or get out of their various vehicles until they had driven through the 5th South African and the 22nd Armored Brigades, firing away as they went. The German infantry was just behind the tanks in their own trucks, and the Ariete Division was on Cruvel's left flank. They were told not to stop for any reason, Only when they reached the infantry of Ravenstein's 5th Regiment along the rise would they stop, and then the now-combined units would finish off what British units there were. 
Cruvel's idea was to use a one-two punch, drive through the enemy to scatter them, and then come back heavily reinforced. During all this, Ravenstein's guns to the north would be blazing away at the British to hopefully draw their attention. Cruvel's attack finally got underway. The British had readied for them by turning around, but they also had to keep an eye out for the guns on the ridge to their north. Coming at the various British units were some 162 German tanks and what the Italians had. Against this were the 30 tanks of the 22nd Brigade. The South African 5th had slightly more. As combat was joined, the Germans and the Italians, as ordered, did not stop, simply getting off the best shots they could while on the move. The South Africans found out very quickly that their anti-tank guns, not the latest or biggest models, were of little use against the Panzers. And though the Germans did not stop, their formation became undone by the stubborn South Africans, as they amassed what guns they had, hoping that coordinated shots would do what the individual guns could not on their own. The 22nd Armored threw in its 30 tanks, which caused some damage. But they then, in their turn, started taking casualties. The fighting went on until darkness. The Germans were certainly more scattered than when they had started out, but the South Africans were very much more so. In fact, they would spend that night, those not captured, some 2,300 out of the 5,700, trying to find each other and eventually getting back together to ready themselves for whatever came the next day. As for Cruvel, he had technically won. His men had not stopped, though the fighting had quickly disintegrated into numerous individual contests, and they had reached the ridge. Yet by that time, he had lost 72 of his 162 tanks. A few more victories like this, and he would be out of the war. However, though the Commonwealth forces had not been able to hold back the attack, nor clear the ridge to their north, other parts of the Allies had better success that day in other parts of the theater. As mentioned, the 4th New Zealand Brigade had captured Gambut, Cruvel's headquarters. Meanwhile, the 6th New Zealand Brigade had gone further west and pushed the Germans off point 175 along the ridge to the northeast of the airstrip. Yet that bit of success had cost the New Zealanders some 400 casualties. That evening, the commanders of both sides, Rommel and Cunningham, worked with what information they had, though limited and sometimes inaccurate. After getting back to his headquarters at El Abdem, just 10 miles due south of Tobruk, Rommel read too much into Cruvel's after-action report. Cruvel was not a man who gave in to flights of fancy, and his report honestly stated that even though many British tanks had been put out of action, he had lost a fair share as well. Still, Rommel focused on the enemy's losses and decided that on the morrow, November 24th, he would finish off the Allied forces threatening the airfield and threatening to relieve Tobruk. Besides which, his forces not currently involved, those further to the south and others to the southeast of them, were running out of supplies. Rommel needed an open route to them, but at the moment the British-led forces were in the way. Yet here's where Rommel mixed the two objectives. He would shatter the enemy where they were and take their equipment and supplies and use those confiscated vehicles to deliver supplies, the Allied supplies, to his forces. It was a stroke of genius that would be on the headlines of every newspaper in the world, if he could pull it off. And make no mistake, Rommel was human enough to care about headlines. Greater glory for him got what he needed from Berlin. Rommel gave out his orders, and yes, they were as bold as brass. The infantry would deal with the New Zealanders and gather up what equipment and supplies they had after the Germans won. Meanwhile, the Panzers of 21st and 15th Panzer Divisions would head southeast 
in an arc using the Trig El Abd Road, or pathway. Make for Sidi Omar, some 45 miles to the east, near the frontier wire. They would then relieve Sidi Omar and then head to the north for Bardia, along the coast. Obviously, the British tanks would try to stop them, which would allow the panzers and their artillery to then destroy them. Why chase the enemy when you can make them come to you? When all was said and done, the Commonwealth forces would be cut off, trapped, and forced to surrender. Their supplies and vehicles now working for the Axis. City Rizig Airfield would once again belong to Rommel, and Tobruk would go back to being an Allied position that was about to be overrun. As has been said for thousands of years, fortune favors the bold. Meanwhile, as the day of the November 22nd had passed, British 8th Army Headquarters was starting to get a clearer picture of their real tank situation. Cunningham spoke to Godwin Austin, commander of 13th Corps, and it was decided he and his would take the lead in destroying the Axis armor and eventually freeing their comrades at Tobruk. As for 30th Corps, under General Norrie, which had been doing the recent fighting, word would spread for all units to head to a position, or rather a line, that ran from the newly acquired position of Point 175 on the eastern edge of the ridge north of the airfield to the south, to Bir El Gubi. There the men would gather, rest, reload, and would already be in a defensive line should another Axis force attack. By the time 13th Corps, coming from the east, using the road Trig Capuzo as its center line, and destroyed the panzers, both forces would then work together to clear or drive around the Germans on the ridge and free the men into Brook. Then all three forces could clear Cyrenaica proper of enemy forces. Egypt would be safe. But as this plan was being worked out, Cunningham was told that 30th Corps only had 44 tanks left. That wasn't true. And that the Germans had 120 left. That wasn't true either. Cunningham was getting downhearted. So he pulled a Beresford Pierce and requested that Auchinleck fly to Madalena to consult. The C&C had already heard rumblings that things were, in fact, not going great, so was en route already. As the top brass talked, the staff officers of the 8th British Army respectfully but firmly told their superiors that there should now not be any talk of giving up. The enemy had been engaged was suffering equally, and now was the time to finish them off. This enthusiasm was picked up by Auchinleck and Cunningham. The fighting, they decided, would go on. As Cunningham was seeing Auchinleck off, he had in his hands his orders from the CNC. The attack was to continue, even if that meant losing every single tank. Their main objective was to destroy Rommel's panzers. Then, if this was done, to take the whole of Cyrenaica. So, as mentioned, Godwin Austin's 13th Corps, made up of New Zealanders, Indians, the 1st Polish Brigade, and two tank brigades, would head west by a route close to the coast and take the fight to the German panzers, who would not be there as they were making their way to the British positions to the east by taking a more southern route. The game of musical chairs would commence on the morrow, yet in the balance of this game was the route to Egypt and the trapped men of Tobruk. Based on the true story that shocked the world. I Critics are calling A Spy Among Friends on MGM Plus a thrilling new Cold War drama. Treason. That's what I'm accusing you of. With spellbinding performances. I am not a traitor! Starring Emmy Award winners Damian Lewis and Guy Pearce. You're trying to get me killed. Give me one reason why not. I love some. A Spy Among Friends. Watch now, only on MGM Plus. (laughs) 
Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 173, Lenin's Civil War. Last time, Lenin had returned to Russian soil, specifically at Petrograd's Finland station on April 3, 1917. And, though not a young man, had climbed atop the armored vehicle that had brought him home and spoke to the people about their needs and what the Bolsheviks were going to do for them. Problem was, many of the people did not know who Lenin was due to his absence. Indeed, many throughout Russia had not even learned of the February Revolution until April, as spring began to thaw out the winter. Yet Lenin's party wasn't the only one promising land distribution for the masses. The army had also recently made promises, as did the provisional government. Certainly, someone needed to do something. The peasants made up 80% of the population, but only owned 47% of the land. And that had only been as recently as the second half of the 19th century, when Alexander II freed the people, more or less, from serfdom. By 1917, the Tsarist government had seized some 15 million acres that were supposed to go to the people, or war heroes. As for the people, they wanted their land, now. And in that frame of mind, the people, fed up with everything, started taking the land for themselves, along with the draft animals and farming tools, all under the name of the Black Repartition, the name coming from Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, that spoke of each man being returned to his own land and freed. Yet the provisional government, not of the people to be sure, but for the people, tried to put a stop to this. The political body claimed, again, that everyone had to wait until the forthcoming Constituent Assembly took place. One can only imagine a rushing, rolling his or her eyes in disbelief is the same the world over. As such, they ignored the statement. Then the various officials tried to have the police stop the people, but that was a non-starter, as the various police departments and paramilitary organizations had been disbanded by the government to win the favor of those very people. Oh, the irony. Still, the provisional government refused to acknowledge the land grabbing. The Russian people, well, they just rolled their eyes again and kept taking what had been promised to them since the Great War started. Much of the land grabbing had been done collectively, as in a village would take gentry land that was idle, as the POW labor was drying up. They worked the land together and divided up the harvest, each one taking something home in their carts, if they had carts. As can be expected, the radicals urged the people on, and to take more. It was theirs, due to their labor making the land produce food. What could not be carried away, like winnowing machines used to separate grain from chaff, was vandalized. Not exactly good for the future, but this wasn't about the future. This was about the now and the past. For many peasants, they simply took what land they had been working for years. Getting back to Lenin, the people were busy with their revolution and didn't need to know who he was. But this man had a place in their lives, or soon would. While this chaos was going on, the Bolsheviks and other political activists were arguing over, well, politics. Marx had said that the path to communism had to go through the stages of capitalism and socialism first. Russia had just left feudalism Barely, and now everyone was in a rush. And yet, the stages had to be respected. But not many of the Bolsheviks wanted to spend too much time on capitalism. And why should they? That was not going to help the majority of the peasants, which meant that they would stay an unruly lot, which was good for the short term, but not for the long view. Which led Lenin to think of having one foot already in socialism, for Russia, by not quite waiting for the capitalist revolution to finish and take hold. By all means, let the necessary revolution continue, but if the Bolsheviks should grab power now, they could make sure the current stage would not last 
any longer than necessary. Meanwhile, back in Petrograd, where the people were used to power resigning, the Bolshevik Russia Bureau, and in this we mean not that part of the Bolshevik Party under Lenin, but the entity led by Alexander Shlepnikov and 27-year-old Vyacheslav Molotov, but not the Mensheviks either, carried on its attacks against the provisional government. This despite the fact that, occasionally, Stalin and Kemenev, also Bolsheviks, spoke out of the possibility of supporting the provisional government, if for no other reason than to finish up with the revolution. That body certainly didn't have the power or status to stop it, so it was best that they were, for now, in charge. Yet the Bolshevik Russia Bureau did not want to hear from Kemenev and barely tolerated Stalin, who was allowed to be labeled an advisor. Neither man was liked by the Bolshevik branch that existed outside of Lenin's influence, but they couldn't be ignored either. They were simply too dangerous and too capable. And because of those two qualities, they could not be turned into enemies. So, the day after Stalin and Kemenev were told that they could not be a part of the Bolshevik Russia Bureau, Molotov, easily as radical as Lenin, was pushed out, the means of which are not clear, and Stalin was allowed to take his place. As for Kemenev, he was made the editor of the party's paper, Pravda. Right away, Stalin and Kemenev made the Pravda echo their own sentiments, that the provisional government could be worked with, at least while it existed. This greatly upset Lenin, who was still not in Petrograd proper, as he was angling for the Bolshevik party to take power, any way possible. For now, Lenin wrote to the two men, who ignored him, though they did print his letter in an altered form in the newspaper. A second letter from Lenin was completely ignored, as its tone had gone up by a few degrees. But then the older leader showed up at the newspaper's front door. On April 6, 1917, a meeting of the Bolshevik Central Committee shot down Lenin's theses that now was the time to take power, and that the process to communism had to be sped up. Just before the vote, the various speakers brought up obvious questions. How can the bourgeois democratic revolution be done? It has just begun. Had the peasants been given their land? Had there been economic reform? Was Russia still, technically, in the war? Had the provisional government simply disappeared on their own? No, was the answer to all of these questions. Even Stalin towed the line by saying that Lenin's theses was a schema. There are no facts in them, and therefore they do not satisfy. Yet, as a sop to their leader, the Pravda printed Lenin's Ten Theses in early April, but made it clear with an editorial the party of Lenin did not support his views. A most curious situation. But more still, the Petrograd Soviet, the body standing opposed to the provisional government, trying to do the same job as the provisional government, was equally not wanting to seize power yet. True, it had established a 72-person All-Russian Central Executive Committee, with departments for food, the economy, foreign affairs, and the like. But for now, it wanted to support the provisional government to get things going and then take over and run the country until proper elections could be held. But though the Petrograd Soviet was so established, about half of its members wanted nothing to do with the provisional government a clear chink in its armor. Lenin railed against the provisional government and the fact that the Petrograd Soviet had voted to support it, which was pretty clever. First mention the generally hated organization and only then mention the slightly more popular body that supported it. That was phase one. Phase two was when Lenin more or less intellectually intimidated members of the Bolshevik party. His will seemed to have no equal. If they spoke in a crowd, he would outshout them and offer the people a better deal. If the party offered a olive branch, Lenin would slap it out of their hands by yelling, Long live the world's socialist revolution. Lenin was telling the people that their time 
had come. And it wasn't over. And yet they could get more by supporting him, even against his own party. Incredibly, this worked. At the end of April, the same month he had arrived back in Russia, at the next Bolshevik Party conference, Lenin's positions were approved. To be sure, some of the votes came from his hardline supporters, others who had been turned or intimidated. But as the party had been outmaneuvered by a political master, for Lenin, this was only a political victory. So the party would grab for power. But when and how? Lenin's answer was direct. The Bolsheviks were actually lagging behind the people in their desire for change. They, the people, were ready. That was all the power the Bolsheviks needed. Almost single-handedly, Lenin had turned the Bolshevik party to his way of thinking. But with his public speeches, he also turned the people, which further turned his own party. It was a self-feeding, spiraling success. As for Lenin, who only wanted to be on the winning side, he crossed the line to stand with Lenin. Stalin, who had mentally shoved aside Lenin just before the February Revolution, re-realized who and what he had been up against. Now, with Lenin calling the shots, Stalin seemed to have come to a great conclusion. He proclaimed, only a united party can lead the people to victory. But Stalin wasn't simply laying down at Lenin's feet. He had his own ideas, ideas that he thought was best for the party and for himself, oh, and Russia. So right out of the gate, when Lenin wanted to nationalize the land, Stalin fought him on this. No, the land should go to the people. And he stayed true to his idea, which eventually won out. Stalin also fought against Lenin's extreme idea that the imperialist war that they were currently in should be turned into a general European civil war. But Stalin again answered no. Dealing with the needs of Russia was enough for now. And in this too, Stalin prevailed. Was he loyal to Lenin? Yes, but Stalin was a thinker. He would be no one's yes man. With things decided thus, it was time for a reorganization. The party needed focus, in the form specifically of a nine-member central committee to direct the larger membership. Of course, Stalin threw his hat into the ring right away, which upset some as they knew his true nature. But Lenin supported him as Jugashvili now supported his leader. Lenin spoke of Stalin's accomplishments, those legal and otherwise, which was not viewed negatively by the party leader. With this support, Stalin got the third most votes, 97, only behind Lenin and Zinoviev. Stalin also got the bonus position of being the new editor of the Pravda. Stalin, the didactic, the self-taught, the writer, the poet, had the ability to take complex issues and make them understandable in writing for the masses. Of course, he led the readers to his conclusions, but that's why he wanted to be the editor, to write for the party and for himself. Yes, he was a member of the party on its central committee, but he still saw himself as being vulnerable. Hadn't there been, before, intra-party contests of which he had come out on the losing side? Yes, but he was determined not to let that happen again. But it was also time to mend fences. Apologizing to Molotov for taking away what had been his position, Stalin thanked him for supporting Lenin all this time. Then he took Molotov's girlfriend away. But this was only done as there had been an opportunity. Like most self-serving humans, Stalin did what he could if no one stopped him. But he wasn't in love. It just happened. She had been responsive to his charm, so he pursued her. About this time, Stalin moved into the apartment of the Aluviev family, which he had known for many years. Their daughter, Nadia, had just turned 16. Stalin was 38, as she was preparing to enter school. 
Stalin treated Nadia and her friends like daughters, thrilling and shocking them with stories of his Siberian exile. True, most of the stories had to be made up for this receptive crowd. In the months to come, Stalin and Nadia, through proximity, would become a couple and would eventually make their relationship known to all. But for now, he was focused on his work. That work was standing beside Lenin and supporting almost everything the party leader voiced. It was assumed by everyone that a vote of some kind would be taking place in the near future, as the provisional government had few supporters. As such, the Bolsheviks wanted to be ready to make an impressive showing. Working beside Lenin and Stalin was a 32-year-old Yakov Zverdlov. Zverdlov was not a thinker or a speaker, but he had an incredible memory, able to memorize everyone's name, everyone's nickname, everyone's location, and most importantly, how loyal they had been to Lenin. He never wrote anything down, but worked with Stalin, though the two occasionally clashed, and showed him how to build a loyal faction. For now, both men were focused on getting potential voters and party members to adhere to whatever Lenin wanted. That was Zverdlov's main job. There was no way to bring the entire Bolshevik party under Lenin's heel, or any other party for that matter. But the two men, working with six female clerks, organized enough people within the various groups to make sure votes ended up going the way Lenin wanted them to. It didn't hurt the Lenin faction of the Bolshevik party that the other organizations were cocking it up at every opportunity. The cadets, another party, but of established politicians, that was attempting a peaceful takeover and working with the provisional government, interpreted the people's will after the February Revolution that they wanted the war with Germany to be fought more aggressively. As for the Menshevik faction of the Social Democratic Party, they believed that the revolution was only bourgeois in nature and did not try to help bring about socialism though clearly the majority of the peasantry wanted some level of socialism in their lives. To further cripple themselves, the Mensheviks joined with the provisional government, the cadets, and the socialist revolutionaries, a growing political party on the left. Yet the Mensheviks continued to attack the provisional government in their propaganda, which only weakened both parties even further in the eyes of the people. The only light shining a possible way forward without civil war, was Alexander Kerensky, a respected moderate, who was a member of the provisional government and of the Petrograd Soviet. And he was putting himself out there as a middle-of-the-road leader. Kerensky proclaimed that he would bring together the bourgeois and proletarian revolutions and stand above the parties and their constant bickering. The Bolsheviks Pravda i.e. Stalin, quickly retaliated by putting out that Kerensky was a slave to cocaine and that he dressed in women's clothing, that he stole from the state. The first two were not true. The last, well, everyone who could did that. But it must be remembered that at one point Kerensky was the darling of everyone, above and below, who wanted to change for the sake of Russia's survival. But that had been before the February Revolution. Now, he was a member of the provisional government, and they weren't getting anything done, mostly because the people refused to support them. Kerensky was now labeled a windbag and a do-nothing. Still, he was putting himself out there as a nonpartisan problem solver. Lenin also spoke out against Kerensky, who returned the favor. When the various left-leaning parties met for the first All-Russia Congress of Soviets from June 3rd to the 24th, Kerensky equated Lenin to Napoleon. Kerensky read everything he could about the French Revolution. He told the Congress that as Russia was fighting amongst itself, like France had been, they all needed to watch out as Lenin would take advantage of the chaos and make himself the dictator. Lenin must not be allowed to speak, he warned, or we will all lose. Yet, 
His words were not heeded, and Lenin survived the accusation. Now that the Congress was over, it was time to hold a countrywide Soviet vote. Out of these 777 delegates to be chosen, the Bolsheviks pulled in a pathetic 105. The Socialist Revolutionaries won 285. The Mensheviks got 248. So what could Lenin's Bolsheviks do that they had not already done to improve their lot? They couldn't rail against the Tsar. He was out of power. The other left-leaning parties were already mostly in line with Lenin for their desire to give the people land. How was Lenin going to stand out? The answer was provided for him, and during the First Congress, no less. Before Nicholas II left the throne, he had promised the Allies that Russia would launch an offensive that spring, but surely that promise would not be kept now. Wherever peasants looked, there were maimed soldiers around them. The people were starving. The former vast heaps of bread that Russia produced seemed to have vanished overnight. Yet the provisional government decided to honor Nicholas's word. One would think that the members of the provisional government had sensed the desire of the people to get out of the war. Everyone spoke and wrote of it. At the very least, they should have used their sense of self-preservation that all politicians seem to have and not vote the way they did. Yet that did not happen. As the announcement was made and what little bread there was gathered for the men about to leave, the people screamed foul, most foul. The provisional government realized its mistake, but too late. Someone had to pay for this. That someone was Paul Milyukov, who had given the provisional government its name and purpose back in February. But he was forced to resign on May 2nd. That left Kerensky as the premier man within the country's barely functioning government. As for the Allies, they needed a Russian offensive desperately. The French had tried in May, and besides growing new mounds of dead, some 49 divisions out of a total of 113 had mutinied. Order was barely restored by General Philippe Pétain, the new commander, but he saw for himself that the soldiers would only defend French soil from now on. The Russian Supreme Commander, Mikhail Alexeyev, pointed out to Kerensky, his new boss, that out of every six or seven million men, some one million had deserted or refused to fight. Still, Alexeyev was willing to try, which wasn't good enough for Kerensky. He sacked the commander and replaced him with General Brusilov, the hero of 1916. Yet when the new commander toured the front, he found the same situation Alexeyev had. Still, Kerensky was determined to see Russia launch an offensive. For one, the Central Powers seemed equally about to collapse, and if the Allies won without Russia, it might not have a place at the peace table. Furthermore, the new leader of the provisional government truly believed that an offensive would reignite Russian patriotism and bring the people to him, allowing him to be the man above the politics that he desired to be. With this gift from the gods, Lenin and his Bolsheviks got to work. Sending out agitators, Lenin's men worked their way through the regiments and through the urban garrisons with bags stuffed of literature that boiled down Russia's complex problems to their essentials. Russia was tricked into giving its blood so Britain might profit. What was the good of offering land to a soldier who was probably going to die, and very soon? To be sure, the German newspapers helped in this propaganda assault, for their own reasons. Within a short time, the Russian trenches of some seven million men already filled with blood, hunger, and disease, now spilled over with Bolshevism. Never taking his eye off the prize, Lenin's men spoke out against the Petrograd Soviet and the Menshevik Socialist Revolutionary Bloc as well. Basically, every group that his faction did not control. So, within a very short time, Lenin had many of the peasants on his side, but also, now, 
millions of Russian soldiers. So no matter how the offensive turned out, whether it was launched at all, Lenin had gained a great deal for his faction. And as he could have arrogantly told Kerensky, had the two ever met again, to these aged eyes, boy, that's what success looks like.